Um, so what I wanted to do, I wanted to look at what do we mean by supported self-management. Let's understand the terminology. I wanted just to touch on the evidence um, around supported self-management. Um, and then I wanted to look at how within healthcare services we can support people to manage their own um, asthma. Um, and then something very dear to my heart at the moment is around how we implement that in routine care. So what do we mean by self-management? Well, here's a definition that we've been using for quite a while. It's been around a long time and it has some important points. It's the tasks that somebody has to undertake in order to live with their long-term condition or long-term conditions. And importantly, that includes the medical management, which is where we are all coming in, I guess, as healthcare professionals, but also about how that impacts on their roles and their emotional well-being within society. So there is a broader element there. So say our focus tends to be, and the evidence base tends to be around the medical management, perhaps inevitably, but let's just put that into a broader perspective. It is actually about how people live with a long-term condition. Let me put this another way. The average patient with asthma is, shall we be really optimistic and suggest that they might spend 45 minutes in each year with an asthma nurse? Many don't ever come just for a review, as we heard earlier. But let's just imagine 45 minutes a year with a nurse, maybe 30 minutes face to face with a, a GP or a doctor. Um, have you all worked out now how many minutes of the year they are looking after their own asthma? It's quite a simple calculation, a matter of addition and subtraction, and the figure is that, okay? So we are not giving, and if there's any message we take away, it's we are not giving people self-management. They are doing it anyway. People are looking after their own asthma almost all the time because we are not there to advise them. So they are making the decisions as to what treatment they take or don't take, what action they take or don't take, whether they come and see us or not. There is, it is their decision. People are already looking after their own. They're already self-managing. Our role is to support them to do it better. So what do we mean by self-management support? Well, it's anything that we can do to help people more appropriately to manage their condition. Because people are not, as we've heard earlier during the day, people don't always make the right decisions. And it's around helping people to make better decisions, health-related behaviours, and improve their clinical outcomes. Um, and this, is, this comes from the um, Health Foundation um, information. They talk about portfolios of techniques to help people. So in other words, there's something very specific about that. But also, it's something to do with transforming the patient-professional relationship so that we are working together to look after people's long-term conditions. This doesn't just apply to asthma. This applies to any condition. Now, this, um, Aya referred briefly to this. She did it in a, a circle. Um, this is the, the PRISMS work that we did some years ago where we looked at the literature. It was a huge sort of task we took undertook where we looked at the literature about supported self-management in long-term conditions. Huge literature. We did it using a meta-review technique where we took the systematic reviews. Um, we actually chose 14 different long-term conditions, of which asthma was one, and they ranged very considerably. Others were stroke. Um, we had COPD in there as well. We had diabetes. We had hypertension, arthritis. Um, and we looked at all the different strategies that people had employed to enable people, to help people support their self-management. And that's the list, the 14. And just looking at that list, that doesn't just apply to asthma though clearly some of it does, the bit that most obviously applies to asthma is this bit around action plans. That's the medical bit you think about. But there are things here about information about the condition, about provision of equipment, that, and some of which actually will probably refer more to the people who are living with stroke or disabling condition. So it's not asthma specific, but it is a useful framework just to be thinking about. The aim, of course, being to, in order to improve people's um, quality of life. So what is the evidence? Does it work? Um, and the answer is yes. We again look at this is from the PRISM's work, 
um, as I say, we looked overall, um, I think we had nearly a thousand randomized control trials we looked at. In the context of asthma, it, it was about 270. And this is a this is not the traditional forest plot that you've seen. These are the summary statistics from the forest plots that we've just plotted on one graph. So that's why they're diamonds, okay? Anything that's on this side of the line says that that meta-analysis favored self-management. So whether we're looking at hospitalizations, whether we're looking at A&E attendances, or whether we're looking at GP consultations, unscheduled care, all these are clearly favoring the group that had supported self-management. It works to um, improve quality of life and asthma symptoms. Um, that we, I couldn't plot these on a, on a graph because the outcome measures weren't um, compatible in that way. But a number that I could quote, self-management reduced days off work and school. It, it, it improved the symptom scores that people were having um, and it improved the number of symptom-free days. They're just some examples. As I say, there were something like 270 studies involved in this. Who does it work for? Well, the answer is just about everybody. Um, whether we're talking about a primary care practice or a large tertiary care population, um, whether we are talking about patients where it's delivered within the hospital, whether it's delivered in A&E, whether it's delivered in a primary care practice, they have all shown benefit. Um, it works for all age groups. There is one caveat here, and that is that it, the standard supported self-management for asthma does not work in the under fives. That is quite likely because, of course, many of them have got viral associated wheeze and the standard responses that we make don't actually work in that age group. That's not to say those parents don't need self-management support. They do because they're having to make decisions about their little wheezy infant. But the standard pros, um, traditional self-management doesn't help. But otherwise it works in, in just about all age groups and it can work for all ethnic groups, um, though it needs to be tailored appropriately to that, that ethnic group. That's what we mean when we talk about personalization. It has to be tailored to the right group. So what is it that works? Now, this is a quote that comes um, from quite a long time ago, one of the traditional studies that gets cited from Gibson as a Cochrane um, review, which still, I believe, is in the process of being updated. But at the moment, we're still using this one. Training in asthma self-management. OK, so there's an education, a supportive role here which involves self-monitoring, I'll come to a bit more about that in a minute, coupled with, and that is really important, coupled with regular medical review. So it's the self-management, the self-monitoring, coupled with reg regular medical review and a written action plan for written IO, could be electronic, um, but however, uh, some form of something you can refer to improves health outcomes. And the optimal strategy for self-management is um, includes education, it includes self-monitoring, I'll come to what I mean by that in a minute, and a written action plan and regular review. And these are the data that that Cochrane review provides, or some of the data that it provides to support that statement. This is a proper meta-analysis, as you can see the various lines, and there's subgroups here. So at the bottom here, this is the group, the two studies, where the patient was self-monitoring, but there was no real review, there was no action plan going on, and it was actually ineffective. So all those apps out there that are monitoring with no action it's actually ineffective. It's not the monitoring that does it. Here it was monitoring but review. But of course, if the person who was doing the review didn't take any notice of the monitoring, then it was unlikely to be effective. I mean, it's a bit like those blood sugars that patients used to bring to us that we ignored in the diabetic review because we only really wanted the haemoglobin A1c. Um, so in other words, it, the, just monitoring and review didn't work particularly effectively, though it's beginning to shift. What did work was the combination of monitoring, a review and an action plan. So people needed to, be know, needed to know what to do if. Asthma is a variable condition and the bottom line is they need to know what to do if something starts to go wrong. And that's the bit that's effective. So that's just summarizing that statement. So an effective action plan needs to have a means of monitoring. 
it needs to have some action points between two and four, more than four, and it's too complicated, less than two, and it's just not sophisticated enough. It needs to tell people what to do in terms of their steroids, inhaled or oral, and crucially, remember the NRAD reports, it needs to tell people when to call for help. So here's an action plan. Now, this is an old version of the um, Asthma UK action plan. I'm using it really because it fits onto one slide and it's easy for, to read. The principles apply to almost any action plan. So basically what it has here are symptoms and a peak flow. Um, and we set thresholds. Now, these thresholds do vary from study to study. So I've taken some fairly standard ones, but five or 10 here or there probably doesn't make a lot of difference. The principles are the same. So no symptoms, peak flow above 80%, continue your treatment. Then if it falls below 80%, increase your inhaled steroids, 60%, start your steroids, contact your clinicians, and below 40%, press the panic button. Okay, so that's the basic principle. A few questions, frequently asked questions. Do they have to monitor peak flows? Of course not. I mean, who on earth goes around monitoring their peak flow every day? I mean, I know there are nerds who do that, but actually the vast majority of people with asthma, life is far too short um, to be mucking about with doing a peak flow morning and evening, frankly. Okay, so let's, let's stop even pretending that people are going to do this. If they want to, that's fine, but most people won't. Symptom-based action plans are just as effective, but they do need to know what symptoms to watch out for and what to do about it. And in fact, there are people who quite like having a peak flow so that if the symptoms start to cause trouble, they can actually check their peak flow to actually reassure them that, yeah, actually I am right to be doing something about this. So sometimes people like to have both, but very few people will monitor their peak flow on a regular basis. And I'm not sure that it's good for them to do so, to be honest. So it works with symptoms, but it needs to be clarified. This is the current guideline. Um, people who are on a low dose of inhaled steroids should increase, not double. We've always said double in the past. Double is probably not sufficient. We need to increase inhaled steroids. Um, four puffs twice a day, the quadrupling is what we are now talking about. So fourfold increase rather than doubling. Now, there was a lot of concern with the previous round of guidelines talking about, well, what if people are already on a high dose? Can we then quadruple? Is that appropriate? Um, and we, it was really rather open in the previous guideline. It's going to remain a bit hesitant, but there is a study which has just been published now, some of you may have seen in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that at whatever starting dose, and they did have people who were on 2,000 micrograms a day of beclomethazone to start with, whatever dose, quadrupling the dose at the onset of the attack, reduced the number of people who required a steroid course by one in five. So in other words, if five people were going to have a steroid course, only four did in the intervention group. So it didn't stop all the steroid courses, it didn't stop all the problems, but it did reduce the number of steroid courses. Um, so is it, and that did apply across the board, but I imagine people are already thinking, oh, but, but that's an awful lot of inhaled steroid. What are the worries? What are the dangers about that? And it clearly requires monitoring. But then, you see, as a GP, I'm responsible for the prescriptions I give. And if somebody is asking me for more and more and more high dose inhaled steroids to feed their action plans, I, I, I could see that. It's around the organizational strategies that make sure that that's brought to my attention and I don't just give the prescription out without thinking about it. I'm in, I am responsible for this. So I think it just requires an organizational, it's, it's like the, how, how do we know people are having too many um, short acting beta agonists that we discussed earlier. We need um, organizational strategies in place. So that is the current, as I say, an interesting study. Some concerns about this potential for too much high dose inhaled steroid, and this, as I say, was a study that was done in adults. I need to just emphasize that. And the importance of rhinitis, as we were saying this morning, if you've come to sensitive and has rhinitis, then we need to build that into the action plan um, so that we also mention what to do with the rhinitis. So the beginning of the hay fever season, start your inhale, nasal steroids. Think about, have you got enough inhaled steroids? You might need a bit more cover during the high pollen count peak. 
Um, all sorts of ways of delivering it. That was, a, a, as I say, an old version of it. There are, you can download the Massimo UK website. This is one that Martin Partridge produced, which is really rather neat, an electronic one, where you actually just fill in on the, the uh, computer screen the number of puffs that the patient has. If they want to use a, a peak flow, you can put it in. And then it comes out with an action plan with pictures on because we heard earlier about the difficulties of people with poor literacy and deprivation. Some people need pictures to help them to understand it. And it actually prints out looking like that. Except it doesn't, because of course, I've only got a black and white printer in my surgery, and it won't look like that with colors on. And that's one of the practical barriers. Um, Susan sitting at the back there did some interviewing in some practices as part of some work we're doing. And we heard one of the problems was that the um, action plans you can download, lovely in their red, yellow, green, and colors, when you print them out on a black and white printer tend to look a mess. And nobody thought of that. Okay. This is something I've been doing for quite a long time. When I give people an emergency course of steroids to have at home, I write their action plan on the side just to remind them again what's on their action plan. Uh, back to technology. This is um, a, uh, an app that I downloaded some years ago um, onto my iPhone, and this is me monitoring my peak flows. And as you can see, I have gone from a peak flow of 450 when I was really very well, um, and over the course of three days, I've taken my peak flow down to 10 um, and said that I was short of breath. The app didn't bat an eyelid. The app did nothing apart from the following morning to tell me that I might like to do my peak flow again. <laughs> now, that is not an action plan. That is monitoring me into an early grave. I would regard that as dangerous. But of course, if the app starts to give me advice about, isn't it time you increased your inhaled steroids? Isn't it time you thought about taking your steroids? <coughs> it's prescribing and it becomes a medical device. Most of the apps that are out there, almost all of them, fall into this category. So beware apps. They are monitoring devices, not action plans, mostly. Um, don't just take my word for it. This is a study that was published some years ago. Lots of apps in English, none of them were fit for purpose. Apps now look, you know, my phone looks like this. Um, more apps than ever, um, but they're still no more likely to include an action plan. So we have still got quite a hurdle to overcome in terms of the um, technology. So that's, does it work? Yes, it does. In what context does it work? Well, you will recognize being in Scotland, you'll recognize the House of Care here. Um, this is an international um, model of care that's widely used. This is the Kaiser Permanente Pyramid. What is shared by all of them is that self-care is there as a fundamental part of the care. Um, and one of the things that we showed in the work that we did was that actually self-management works within a context. It's not something you do in isolation. It's part of the care of somebody with asthma. How much does it cost? Um, this is the sort of plot beloved by health economists. Um, basically, these dots are all different studies with the cost. And we have on this axis quality of life, and on this axis we have the cost. So anything that appears in that, all the dots in that column, um, in that quadrant at the bottom there, um, basically we got improved quality of life for less it costs less, um, and here the total costs improve quality of life and they were non-significantly more expensive. So it was a, it's either, it's, it's either no different or slightly cheaper because of course it reduces hospitalizations. So that was our conclusion. It doesn't lead to significant costs. So the guidelines are clear. Everybody with asthma should have, everybody's asthma is variable condition. Everybody should have an action plan that tells them what to do if. Um, and you'll be delighted to know that both sets of as British asthma guidelines agree that this is an appropriate approach. And you've already heard about this. This is the appalling statistic about the number of people who died before they got help. That action plan needs to reinforce when people should seek help. So how can health services help? Well, 
We've talked about action plans and regular clinical reviews, but there's so much more that we could do. Just making sure people have got access to information, just um, monitoring, but be very careful. It's not just monitoring, it needs an action plan. We heard about remote consultations. One of the things we just tried playing with, and I mean playing, we just, just tried the technology out, um, was actually, you know, now you can do a remote video consultation. Why can't you share your screen and fill in the action plan during that consultation? Well, it can be done. Um, Attend Anywhere, which is the Scottish video consulting technology, um, it's not quite as good. If you use Zoom, it's even better because you can really share the screen and then print it off afterwards. If you use Attend Anywhere, there are rather more firewalls involved um, and the patient isn't able to actually put anything in themselves. It can only the clinician can add it in and the patient can't download and print it. Um, I imagine that's a firewall problem. But, you know, why not? We should be able to deliver action plans remotely if that's appropriate for people. Smart inhalers and improving adherence, support for adherence is important um, to think about. And of course, we've got inhaler devices and you've already seen some technology that can support that and the lifestyle changes that are appropriate. So a lot of these supportive mechanisms can be delivered by one means or another through the NHS. But the challenge is making this happen in real life. Everything I've shown you is all around, um, it's experimental and in randomized trials. Can we make it work in real life? Now, these data are a few years old now, and they suggested, this comes from ASPA UK, who um, have a, a sort of a poll every year to try and establish the standards of care. Uh, this particular one was 2014. They reckoned about a third of people in the UK had an action plan. Uh, slightly better in Scotland than in um, England, I see. Um, this had improved, they, they reckon, to about 44% um, a year or so ago. Looks as though it's improving, though actually I'm a little bit suspicious. These were people who replied to an ASME UK survey. I just wonder whether that's actually a selected population. Um, because when we looked at clinical records for 500 people, we found the figure that where the, an action plan appeared to have been given, recorded as being given, was actually as low as 6%. My guess is the truth lies somewhere between the two. You will, however, notice that our Northern Ireland is doing remarkably well. Um, and there is a reason for that. Um, one of the PhD students in Edinburgh looked at this recently. There is a reason for that. They had an incentive scheme, a locally enhanced service, which actually supported practices to provide supported self-management for asthma and provision of asthma plans. And right the way through, they managed to achieve 60%, which is interesting. It says something about the importance of the organization in enabling change to happen. So what we know um, from the systematic reviews that we've done is that it is possible to implement supported self-management in routine practice, but we need to think about three things. One is we need to actively engage the patients and provide what they need, appropriate action plans, different languages tailored to the needs of that particular group of people. We need to train and motivate the professionals so that people feel confident to deliver an action plan, to talk about supported self-management. And we need an organization that prioritizes and supports. We, there was a study done in Aberdeen, not that, maybe about five or 10 years ago now, where nurses were trained you know, a good health um, psychology based training in order to try and behavior change. And nurses were trained to deliver supported self-management. They went back to their practice and forgot about it. Because of course, by that time, the, you know, the, it was time to do the flu jabs or the cervical smear targets were down or all the other things we do. The organization wasn't on board. So that brings me to the final few points that I wanted to just make about a project that's engaging a lot of our time now, which is IMPART. This is a, um, a program grant funded by the NIHR, the National Institute of Health Research. And we are aiming to implement supported self-management in routine care, part of normal care that we're delivering to people um, in primary care. Um, we finished a program development grant and I'll show you one or two of the findings from that. 
um, and we are now embarking on the major programme grant, developing the strategies, um, and we are about to um, set up and, and run a trial evaluating our implementation strategy. This is a five-year programme of work. Um, so what are we doing? We are thinking about what the patients need. Patients told us that they learnt about their asthma over time. It's obvious, really. There was a background, but then they had personal experience of asthma, and that's how they learnt about it. Contact with the healthcare services over time influenced that. But at any given point in time, there were actions they took that were habits, and there were actions they took that required them to think more carefully. So there's the habits, the taking an inhaler when you clean your teeth in the evening, the habit that when you get a bit breathless, you take your blue inhaler, the habits that you've done it before you even think about it. And then there were things that require you to think about because you've suddenly been drawn up short, worse than usual, things don't respond as you expect, an acute attack, and that's where action plans potentially have a role. So we're looking at the action plans that people need um, and, and making them available to the practices. We're thinking about what the organisation needs to do. Um, and Susan, who's sitting at the back here, did this qualitative work in some practices. Now, tell me if this fits with the practices you're familiar with. Action plans are delivered by nurses in a face-to-face -face consultation. Yes? Yes. OK, um, so a patient, you know, the nurse is given an asthma review slot. It might be 10 minutes, it might be half an hour, but it's given a slot. Um, she may or he may have resources available um, and there'll be some admin support in terms of inviting the patient in. Am I getting some body language that that fits more or less? Um, but there are blocks there, particularly the invitations. Do people with asthma always respond to the invitations? No, often not. So there are some blocks there. OK, a lot of it's centred around a review template on the computer. OK, which may or may not actually focus on action plans. Um, some of you, I don't know whether anybody here is using EMIS templates. OK, it says asthma management plan is towards the bottom of the first screen in an asthma review. Not asthma self-management plan, asthma management plan. Now, if you tick that box, does that mean you've given a self-management plan or just that you've looked at the medication? Very unclear. There is actually another one for self-management, but that's on the next screen, well hidden away. So lots of issues around how templates are devised. Now, the GP is also seeing these people with asthma in a separate box, okay? And the GP is seeing them acutely in an, a normal morning surgery or an emergency surgery, okay? During which we have absolutely no time available. We're rescuing somebody and they've probably got on average two and a half problems with them anyway. <laughs> so we haven't actually got the time to fill in the plans and anyway, we couldn't find the plan to give them even if we wanted to. Am I more or less right? Okay, so we have a problem there, but the GPs all know that it's a good thing to do so the GP says, I think you need an action plan. I'd like you to go and see my nurse. Do they go? Obviously not. So can you see how the organisation is not enabling this to happen in some way? Um, we can't solve all the problems. There are some things we're doing. We're looking at improving the invitation letters to focus on self-management. So the patient comes in expecting an action plan rather than, you know, it, it's bringing the patient into this. When they've had an acute episode, the letter says, come in and see your nurse, you need an action plan. So in other words, we're preempting it. Um, we're looking at improving the template so that it starts with what is the patient's problem? What does the patient want to talk about? How easy that is to get forgotten when you're filling in a template. And it then goes on to say, has the patient got an action plan and offers if some you know, um, icons to tick to download one. So we're trying to improve the templates to support it, easy access to resources, and of course, because the organisation needs to buy into this, an audit and feedback strategy. OK, professional education, this is something we're also looked at the systematic review. What we needed to do was develop the team. The GPs all knew it was a good thing to do. We said to the GPs, oh, that's interesting. What is it that your nurse does then? And the GP said, ah, um, 
because the team isn't working together. So we're going to try a little bit of team building so that people are supporting each other. Um, just knowing what we're all doing. Local opinion leaders are important. Motivational interviewing and developing various skills. It's got to be based on guidelines and evidence and some of the um, behavioural regulation techniques that health psychologists uh, teach us about. And we are currently with Education for Health developing a couple of modules that can be used, one within the team and one for the individual who's got likely to be spending the most time delivering action plans and supported self-management. So we're pulling all this together. We are going to be recruiting around the UK 144 practices in three centres. Um, one is in Edinburgh, um, one is in Sheffield and one is in London. Um, we're going to be recruiting 144 practices. We're going to be randomising the practices. One group, the intervention group, will get this three-sided um, strategy, the patient resources, the professional education um, and the organisational strategies including audit and feedback facilitated. We're going to have a facilitator go in a couple of times to each of the practices and the control group practices will not get the intervention. We're going to follow up for two years. Why? Because you can't see all your people with asthma in the first week. It's going to take a year or so to see the people with asthma and we're going to then follow up for two years and we're going to be assessing the outcomes on the number of unscheduled asthma consultations using routine data. We're not recruiting patients. You don't recruit patients in real life. We're going to want to see what difference this is making in a practice population and look at health economics. We're also going to record action plan provision um, so that we know how this has actually been implemented. And there'll be a process evaluation to understand that. So that's our project, as I say, funded by the NHR. If anybody here in practice is interested in helping us, we are currently recruiting practices. See me or Susan, who's at the back here, Susan. Um, and we've got some various ways that you can contact us. We are looking for practices either based in Edinburgh or based in, you know, well, Scotland. We're happy to move towards um, Dundee or um, Glasgow and potentially Aberdeen, why not? Um, you know, we, want, we need practices who are prepared to help us do this um, and see if we can actually show that we can make a difference to people with asthma in routine clinical practice and not just in trials. So some take home messages. People with asthma are already self-managing. Our role is to support them to do this better. We know that as an intervention, self-management works. Um, it needs to be tailored for individuals, it needs to be tailored to the clinical context, um, but it does work and it reduces acute care. In the context of a variable commission, an action plan is crucial, but just let's remember it's part of living with asthma. Implementation is challenging, um, and we need to think about the professionals, the patients, and the organization when we try to implement it. Um, and I think particularly the organizational routines are really crucial. So thank you very much for listening to that. Um, and I hope it's been helpful. Any questions we've got a couple of minutes before I just wrap up and thank people when you're looking at primary care practices are you going to look at kind of the heterogeneity of the practices like those for example with multiple salaried and locum GPs and two partners and yeah. you're going to yeah Yep, we're going to include a whole range of practices. Um, so there will be big practices, little practices. There'll be practices, as you say, that have a lot of salary partners. We're not restricting the practices, um, apart from the fact that they will take part with us. There are some complexities because how do we handle federated practices? If you've got two or three practices working together, we may not be able to include more than one practice from a group in terms of randomization. But yeah, we, we are not restricting them. We hope we will get practices from rural areas, from urban areas, from cities, from deprivation areas. And we want a complete range. We want England, Scotland, <laughs> definitely. This is real life we're aiming, as near to real life as we can make it, basically. <laughs>